of God again, not to, not to talk about the gospel. Peter and John leave, they go back to church, very important. They go back to church and they, they tell the people what happened, exactly what God did through them, and they pray. And when they pray, it says that the Spirit of God came down on that place and the place was shaken. Like physically, you could feel it being shaken. And the Holy Spirit came and it said the Holy Spirit filled them. Now, they had already received the Holy Spirit, so there was a filling of the Holy Spirit. And so when this happened, there was a, a, like a new anointing, a, a filling up of overflowing of the Holy Spirit on the church, which had grown. 3,000 were saved the first day in Acts chapter 2. 5,000 were saved in Acts chapter 4. So the church is growing. These people were filled to overflowing with the Holy Spirit, and it changed their public life. They were never the same again. So sometimes the fear is that we become this traditional church. We go to church, and it becomes what we do, but it does not become who we are. And that's why I say sometimes playing church can literally kill you. And I don't mean, let's get into it. Let's look at this. So, so if, if religion, if Christianity, if the gospel does not change you publicly and privately, it has not changed you. You cannot reserve one and not the other. It is going to do everything. And so I want to look into this scripture and just to find out that what we're about to read in Acts chapter 5, verses 1 through 11, is some of the most fear-filled verses in the Bible. Remember, this comes at a time where where there have been people healed of, of legs being withered and never walking before. Great things are being done. Thousands of people are being saved, and then this comes along in the church. If you would, read with me Acts chapter 5. 1 through 11. It says, But a certain man named Ananias and Sapphira, his wife, sold a possession. And he kept back part of the proceeds, his wife also bearing witness of it, and brought a certain amount and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said to Ananias, the husband, Why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back part of the piece of the land for yourself? While it was yours, it remained, and it was your own possession. And after you sold it, it was your own to, co- to control. Why have you conceived this thing in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. Verse 5. Then Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and breathed his last. So great fear came upon all those who heard these things. And the young men rose up, wrapped him up, and carried him out and buried him. Now it came about three hours later that his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. And when Peter answered... And And Peter answered her, tell me whether you sold the land for so much? And she said, yes, for so much. Then Peter said to her, how is it that you have agreed together to test the spirit of the Lord? Look, the feet of those who buried your husband are at the door and they will carry you out also. Verse 10, then immediately she fell down at his feet and breathed her last. And the young men came in and found her dead and carried her out and buried her with her husband. So great Fear came upon all the church and upon all those who heard these things. Would you pray with me? Fathers, we have opened your word and uh, read these very difficult scriptures. Father, I pray that it is more than just black words on a white page. I pray that you would, through your spirit, as you did in this day, speak to us. Father, speak in a clear way that convicts us through your word, that will change our life, Father, to the decisions we make forever. Father, I pray that whatever the needs be in here this morning, and no doubt there are many, that your will will be done. Father, break proud hearts, break deaf ears and blind eyes to be able to see and to be able to hear from you again. Lord, I pray that your will, your perfect, sovereign will would be done this morning. I pray and ask all these things according to your son's name, Jesus. Amen. So if you remember, just in verse in chapter 4 there, something happened. This is not normal, and I'm not asking for it. As a matter of fact, I would, I would calm you to not try this today. Something happened in chapter 4 when the Holy Spirit came in. The people decided on their own. Peter did not say this. John did not say this. The people, many of them, as a matter of fact, decided to sell many of their possessions, their land, their homes, to sell the possessions and to give it to the church, to give it to the Lord, and let the Lord use it as he pleased so that no one had need, so that no one was destitute, hungry, homeless, all these things. They sold their possessions. And so that's kind of the lead up to this thing. And then we get to Ananias and Sapphira. They've kind of followed suit. They've seen this happen. Many people were doing it. And they got in their mind, we'll do the very same thing. But they were deceived a little bit. They were tempted by their flesh. Very, very easy for us to experience. Matter of fact, I I imagine for the last six days before this one, 
you experienced the very same thing, a tempting in your flesh, a desire to do something that was out of God's order, that was out of His, His given and proper word for your life, whether you're lost or saved. You were tempted. They were tempted. Can you imagine this scene? Can you imagine it happening? Can you, can you vision actually being there when this man came in and said, I gave such and such money to you, church, to the church. This is all to the Lord. And he dropped dead before Peter. Could you imagine seeing that? Could you imagine hearing it later? Eyewitness accounts, people coming up to you. Did you hear what happened to church on Sunday? Could you imagine if that happened today? It would spread. It would definitely be heard and known. Remember, this comes at a point when all of good things had been happening. People were being healed. People were being saved. And now in church, two people died because they lied to the Holy Spirit. How can you reckon this? How can you put these two things together in the first chapters of the book of Acts? Well, I want to remind you, God takes his church very seriously. This is not a thing to be played with. This is not a a thing to just be done so that it gives you some benefit or makes you feel better like I've been to church and so I can stamp that approval on the rest of the week and move on doing my thing. This is very serious to God. This is his bride. His son, Jesus, literally died for the church. He died for this group of people, not the building, but for what we do here, how we worship him, how we sing to him, how we pray to him, how we hear from him. That's the purpose of this church. And here, I want you to hear that God takes it very seriously. I would like for you to go back sometime this week, maybe even today, and read Matthew chapter 18. If you're not sure if this has ever happened before again, just read Matthew chapter 18 and you'll see kind of how serious God takes his church service and his church work. Now, notice that the property of them selling it and giving it, it wasn't given to Peter. It didn't give it to Peter and make the apostles wealthy. They weren't now some kind of landowners and they become uh, these, these, just think of pastors today that say, give me your money, give me your seed money, give me these things and you'll be blessed. That's not at all what Peter and John are saying. They're doing this, they're they're not saying it at all. The people are compelled by the Holy Spirit to give, and they're giving it so that the work of the church can go on. They're being compelled by the Holy Spirit to do this. And the purpose is not so, hear me, it's not so that people wouldn't be hungry, although that is a good thing to, to provide food. It's so that the gospel can go out and be heard without distraction. But see, during this revival that's taking place, and this happens throughout the world when revivals take place, people forget to work. People leave their jobs. People... People spend their free time doing something totally different than they did the day before. They want to share the gospel. Do you remember, those of you that know Christ as your Savior, hear this. Do you remember what it felt like the next day? Do you remember the the joy that was in you? You couldn't contain it. You couldn't hold it back. You had to go tell somebody. Think of it. 8,000 people were just saved in the last few weeks in this book of the Bible. They want to go tell people, and so they are. And so the the gospel is going out, and great things are happening. The view, this Christian view of the church is truly being changed. The Holy Spirit has filled them so much so that that their orientation of life has kind of flipped upside down. The day before, they were all about that personal gain. How can I get more property? How can I get more land? How can I get more influence? The next day, they were giving it away. Everything had turned upside down. Their, their, their personal and private life had come together and they were now willing to lay it all at the apostles' feet. Chapter 4, verse 34 says this. It was in last week's reading. It says this, chapter 4, verse 34. All who were possessors of land and houses sold them and brought the proceeds of the things that were sold. And they laid them at the apostles' feet and they, dis- and they distributed them to everyone who had need. There was no coercion. There was no demanding. There was no guilt feeling of do this, do this. It was just a Holy Spirit-led thing, a very pure thing, a very very loving thing that was done. A voluntary act from many people, it said, because they had been filled by the Holy Spirit. Because that Sunday when they prayed, they were filled with the Holy Spirit, and they naturally just gave everything they had to the Lord. This is the result of what happened. It is not socialism, it's not communism, it's not Christian nationalism. And I'm not asking you to do it today. I would never ask you to do that. It must be a Holy Spirit-led thing to give anything to the Lord. So, this is what is happening in this church. And so, this natural outpouring of the Holy Spirit is being filled and the, 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 the sin and depravity of men is being shown to the, to the surface. And notice that the giving of the property is not the main point. Peter doesn't say, look at all this money we have now, we can build a church. He didn't say, look at what what we have now, all these possessions, 
we can now start a new ministry. The purpose was to share the gospel locally right there in Jerusalem. To share the gospel and to continue to share the gospel. The gospel was the main event, the main reason. So now how do we get from people selling all their property, the Holy Spirit moving to what we just read in chapter 5? How do we get there? We get from people willingly laying down their possessions in front of God to a, to a couple, a husband and wife, lying about what they had done and being judged by it. Well, I can tell you we get there very quickly. Very quick. As a matter of fact, it's almost so fast as a Sunday morning to a Monday morning. Think of it. How often this happens in our own life. We're, we're deceived by Satan. We're, 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 we desire this sin, and this pride, and this covetousness to take over us. And that's exactly what happens here. It happens so quickly that, that people are willing, people in the church are willing to lie about what happened because it was a game they were playing. They desired to have the applause of people. They desired to have people come alongside them and say, did you see what Ananias gave and Sapphira? They gave all of that to the Lord when actually they had not. They had held back a portion of it. And this is often what we deal with. We deal with this pride of life, this arrogance, this desire for people to see us for more than we are. If you're here this morning, why are you here? It's a legitimate question. Why are you at church? I would ask you to ask yourself that question. Why am I here? Some of you might have to scratch your head for a little bit. No, wouldn't. I didn't wake up early. You know, I had other things to do. Why, why are you here? I hope, I pray that you're here to hear the gospel, which is the exact reason why Peter and John were preaching the gospel. It's the reason why we do what we do here on a Sunday morning. We're here to worship and to serve a, a God that died for us, willingly gave up his life to die for us. But here you have Ananias and Sapphira. They come and they, they give this money, so to speak, to it. And, and it looks like, like Peter has some inside information. We don't really, we're not given how Peter knows this, but do you, did you read what Peter asked them? Why have you lied to the Holy Spirit? See, what is done in secret, church, what is done in secret never stays in secret. It always comes to the, it always comes to the surface, does it not? How many times have you sinned? How many times has courts sinned thinking no one ever knows about this? No one will ever find out about this. I've gotten by with this. But you know what you do when you sin in secret? You have, a, you have an audience of one. His name is God. When you sin in secret, you have an audience of one, and his name is God. He's watching every moment and every option, everything that you do. And so here they are. They, they think they're getting by with this. They think that it is a, a, a private spectacle that they're a part of, but it's public. It's so public, in fact, that, that Peter even knows this. The Holy Spirit must have in some way told him. And so he called Ananias out on it and then Sapphira, and they're judged. Luke chapter 8, verse 17. If you don't, by the way, in your bulletin, there's a, a slip of paper that has many of these scriptures on it. I would encourage you to have that out now to take it home with you on the back side of our order of service, and it gives these verses. I don't want you to just kind of visually see it for a few seconds and to think, well, that made some sense, but I don't really understand. I want you to go back later and study it. So here it is, Luke chapter 8, verse 17. It's also written there. It says, for nothing in secret, for there is nothing in secret that will not be revealed, nor anything that is hidden that will not come to the light. Now, let me read that again for you so that you hear it clearly, because this is an important scripture. Luke chapter 8, Verse 17, it says, For nothing is secret that will not be revealed, nor anything hidden that will not be made known and come to light. What is done in secret will not stay there. The sins always follow. It says in the Scripture that some sins go before a man, and other sins follow behind them. But the sin is definitely there, and it will be known. So in verse chapter 1, we see there that Ananias and Sapphira, they sold those possessions. They, they laid it down there before Peter, and Peter said to him these words. Pay attention here what he said to him. He said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit? Now, if you just read that in a cursory reading, you might say that, that it's not Ananias' fault. Satan filled his heart. No, no. Remember what had just happened to the rest of the church. They were filled with the Holy Spirit. Ananias and Sapphira have been filled with a different spirit. They've allowed this, this filling of Satan. He says, why has Satan filled your heart? He had to allow it. 
He had to he had to receive this temptation, and then it has to go from a conception, an idea of sin, to then being conceived and being birthed into full blown sin. See, if he had just stayed with the idea, yeah, I could do that. I was tempted to maybe do that, but I didn't do it. He's okay. But as soon as he takes that and then he creates it into an actual full-blown knowledge, he gives birth to it and then he comes and he sells and he lays some of the money down, keeping it for himself. It is a sin. He says, why have you done this? Why have you allowed Satan to fill your heart and that you would lie to the Holy Spirit? I would dare, I would dare say that all of us are guilty of lying. Anybody disagree? If you are, you are a liar. We've all lied. We've all lied to our close friends, to our family, probably to our spouse, most likely even to yourself. But you know who you never get by with lying to? The Holy Spirit. To lie to God, to, to, to esteem to be more than you actually are, to lying to the Holy Spirit, that's what Ananias and Sapphira are doing. They want to look more spiritual than they actually are. They want to be observed to be more spiritual than they actually are. They're more concerned with this outward appearance. They're more concerned with what people are looking at than who they are inside. And this is a danger of ours, church. Be aware of your motives. Always be aware of your motives. Why have I done this? Why have I said this? Why am I currently doing this? And if you're doing it for a selfish motive, if you're even doing it for another person first, it's not proper order. It must be for the glory of God. If you give something to the Lord, it's to the glory of God. If you do something for the Lord, it's to the glory of God. If you, if you give your life to be burnt on, the, on a stake, it's for the glory of God. Not for yourself, not for your neighbor, ultimately for the glory of God. Can you imagine lying to the Holy Spirit? Trying to get by with the fact that you actually sold it for more than you did. You claiming that you gave your property for this amount. So why did they feel like they needed to lie? Why did they feel like they should do this? Again, it's to impress men. And you're not not out from this. You're not free from this. I promise you, each of you are trying to impress someone, even here today. There's something you've already done today, whether it's the clothes you put on, the way you fixed your hair, maybe the cologne you should have worn. You're impressing someone else. But do you stop to make sure that you first desire the glory of God in your life? Is that why you're here? Is that who you want to appear to be holy before? Because you cannot lie to him. A lot of times we want to appear holier than we are willing to be. Let me repeat that. Just let that sink in for a second. Oftentimes, both lost and saved, we desire to be holier than we're willing to be. We want to look more than we are. Think about how often... And how much of our lives uh, we serve and we live for the wrong person. My boss. By the way, who's my boss here this morning? I don't work for you. (laughs) I serve the Lord. I have one. You know how many you have? One. It's not your husband, not your wife, children, it's not your parents. Your boss is the Lord. It's, It's God. That's who you should desire to live for. And if you live for him, it really does not matter who you displease. But if you displease him, it does not matter who you please. It is for the glory of God. Ananias and Sapphira did not understand this. They didn't know why they were created. We were created for one purpose. The Westminster Shorter Catechism says this. What is the the purpose of man? The glorification of God. Why were we created? To glorify God. If you were doing any other thing, you're out of order. You're not purposefully living for the Lord. So I tell you that they had two problems. Let me give you these quickly. As we move, Ananias and Sapphira, and I, and I dare say many of us today have two problems. One, we do not fear God. In order to lie to the Holy Spirit in the way that Ananias and Sapphira did, it's, it's evident that they did not have a fear of God. And you say, preacher, that does not sound very nice. All I've heard about my entire life is the love of God, that he loves us. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And that is true. That Praise the Lord, that's true. He does love his, love us, but he is not only love. As much as God is loving, he is also wrath-filled. He cannot be loving if he is not just. He must be just, which means he must punish every sin, or he is not loving. You cannot be one or the other. How do you know that I love children? I've asked this before. How do you know that I love children? Not because I have four, but because I hate abortion. 
It's that simple. I can't love one without having a hatred for something that is against it, that is opposed to it. Same with God. He loves us, yes, but our purpose in life is to glorify Him. And the way we do that is through fear. Now, there's two types of fear. There's two people in here fearing to this morning. I promise you, if you understand Scripture, there's two types of fear. One is a fear of a lost person, a person that has rejected Christ's forgiveness over their life, who says, I'll do it my way. I'll be good. I'll be moral. I'll turn over leaf. I'll try to forget these things and not do these things any again. And God's got to forgive me, right? He's got to allow me into heaven. No, he does not. There is a lost person that says, I fear God when I, when I read and hear about hell because of his judgment. And that is proper. That is ordered. You should fear God in that way. There's two types of fear. The other type of fear is a fear of awe and wonder. That's the Christian. It's the fear that I very much have of God. I fear God. I fear him in a way that causes me to respect him. I would never come to God and say, what's up, man upstairs? What's up, dude? It's not a proper order. I wouldn't even talk to my own father that way. Why would I talk to the God of creation in such a way? It's an awe and a reverential fear. It's the fear that I, that I want to serve him and live for him with every order and purpose of my life. To bring him glory with everything I do. That's the fear that I have of God. It says perfect love casts out all fear. Perfect love. A fear of God is perfect love. And it casts out all the fear of judgment, but not a fear of awe and respect. So there's these two things. One, Ananias and Sapphira do not fear God in any way. They don't fear his judgment and they don't fear to respect him. They lie to the Holy Spirit. Second problem they have is they look for the applause and the acceptance of man more than the acceptance of Christ. They would rather have a man come along and pat them on the back. Peter just said, well done, thou good and faithful Ananias, than to hear God say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. They look for the applause of man. They don't have a fear of God. Here's a couple that are guilty of lying to the Holy Spirit. The outcome What's the outcome? Chapter 5, death. Physical death. It happened there. It was, it, was, it was in the presence of them. What would happen today if God was working in the same way this morning? If you lied to the Holy Spirit and you dropped dead, I would say we would need a lot of people to carry us out of here. There is a grace, a common grace that God is giving us that he did not give to Ananias and Sapphira. They lied to the Holy Spirit. They knew what they were doing was wrong, and they were judged immediately. The outcome was judgment. The result, what's the result, church? Fear came upon the entire church. Now, if you saw people coming to Christ, 3,000 in Acts chapter 2, 4,000 in Acts chapter 5, the church is growing. Then say anything about fear coming on the church until this happens. And then this healthy fear, Galatians chapter 6, verse 7 and 8, speaks to this how a fear comes over a church. And it says this, Galatians chapter 6, verse 7 and 8. Do not be deceived. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man sows, he will also reap. For he who sows to the flesh will reap flesh corruption. But he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. There's the answers. There's the answers. God will not be mocked. If you think you can lie to the Holy Spirit, Scripture proves you wrong. Ananias and Sapphira, prove you wrong. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 31 says this, it is a fearful thing. Did you hear that? It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. It did not say it's a wonderful, loving, caressing, joyful experience to be in the presence of a living God. It says it's a fearful thing. Awe, wonder, respect. His authority over your life, Him controlling you, it's a fearful thing. Are you a Christian this morning? You know who knows the answer to that question? Not me. Not even your wife, not your husband, not your mom and dad. Not the church, not your baptismal certificate. The only person that knows the answer to that question is you. Are you a blood-bought follower of Christ this morning? Then you will love the things of God. Here's the answer. Are you a question? Are you, are you curious? Maybe I am. Maybe I'm not. Let me ask you, are you a Christian? Then you will love the things of God. What are the things of God? You'll love His Word. You'll love the Word of God. You'll love the Bible. You'll love His church. You'll love His worship. You'll love giving Him glory. 
Now, are you lost? Then you'll love the world. And you'll despise these things I just spoke of, the word, the God, the church, the worship, the glory. Those won't matter to you, except for maybe every once in a while when you're convicted to go to church or you hear something in your conscience or in the town that causes you to be pricked for just a moment. Do you love the word of God? If you don't, there's, a, there's reason to be worried. There's reason to be concerned for your flesh. There's judgment Just like Ananias and Sapphira, there should be concern on your heart. Do you worship God? Do you fear and respect? Do you reverence Him? Now I'm going to read you a couple verses from Matthew. I want you to hear these very closely. These are by far the scariest verses in all the Bible. And I don't read them lightly. Hear them closely, though. Hear them closely and let the conviction of the Holy Spirit speak to you. If if you're not being convicted, fine. Close your eyes, close your ears. But if these do not convict you, then you are dead. And I pray that the Holy Spirit waken you. This is Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 through 23, and it says this. This is Jesus speaking. He says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he who does the will of my Father in heaven, many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? Do you see that? And then it goes further and it says, and then I will, it's a capital I, Jesus speaking, then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. Playing church can kill you, both physically and spiritually. Now I ask you this morning, have you ever been blood-bought by Jesus Christ? Have you ever come to a point where your sin has so convicted you that you cannot but repent to an all-loving and all-forgiving God? He is not a God that will overlook sin. He will not just say, okay, he meant well. I'll let him into my heaven. You must believe, you must repent. It takes those two things. Have you come to an understanding of your own sin? Do you see lying worthy of eternity in hell? If you don't, you do not understand sin. Do you see lust in your mind as worthy of hell? Then you don't understand sin. Do you see stealing something, no matter the value, a dollar, five dollars, a million dollars, do you see theft as worthy of being punished in hell for eternity? If you don't, then you do not understand sin. Do you see your sin, your secret sin, as being justly rewarded with hell? Then there's hope for you. Then there's hope for you to come to an understanding of Jesus' repentance and forgiveness. This morning, we're going to have an invitation. We're going to give you an opportunity to repent of your sin to a God that desires. He says, come to me, all you are weary and heavy laden. Come to me, my yoke is light. But you must repent. You must believe that causes him, that makes him, it allows him to be your savior. But I want to tell you about a different side of the coin. There's another part of salvation and it's called making him your Lord. Jesus will not allow you to only take him as your savior and to deny him as your Lord. You must have both or you have neither. He will not share you with the world. You can only serve one master. Now, if you make him your savior, if you say, forgive me of my sins, then you must also say, take my life and lead me, Lord. You are in perfect control. I'm your slave. I'm your doulos. What you say, I'll do. If you're not willing to do that, then you are not wanting to be saved. He will not accept anything less. So this morning, I'm going to ask you in just a few moments to stand with me, and we're going to sing a few hymns. The opportunity is for you to be doing business with the Lord. If he has convicted you of anything in your life, what will you do? You will either say, not today, and walk out of here as lost as you came in, or you will say, today is the day of until salvation. I desire you, Lord. Come and heal me, forgive me, and save me. Would you pray with me, please? Fathers, we come to you this morning at this time um, in your service on your day with your word. Father, I pray that your conviction is here that it is felt, that your spirit is moving. Father, only you can save. 
Lord, only you can break a hard heart and bring sight to the blind. Lord, I pray this morning that none, that none would deny you, Father. I pray this morning that your spirit would move in our hearts and our lives, that we would, we would leave here different than we came in. Father, we would leave here uh, caring less about the applause of man and caring only about the applause of you, the great God of kings. Father, I pray that each one would repent, be broken of their sin. Father, desire to live and to serve you, to bring you glory, the only reason and the purpose that we were created. Father, I ask all these things in your son's perfect and beautiful name. In Jesus, I pray. Amen. Would you stand with me, please?